Welcome to the Top Order podcast coming to you from Auckland today. We're a little bit warm under the bright studio lights, but the first crack uh, an integrated video podcast. Um, it remains to be seen whether that will happen, um, but do check the YouTube channel if you want to see our faces as well as listen to our dulcet tones on your normal podcast provider. Tonight we are going to talk about, look, another fantastic win for the Black Caps against Sri Lanka at the Basin Reserve. We'll talk some bits and bobs, India, Australia, Sophie Devine, and the proliferation of T20 white ball cricket going on all around the world, including, I think it's called Major League Cricket in the USA, all coming up on the Top Order podcast. Stay tuned. So, boys, it seems to be a common theme at the moment. We've got to start with another New Zealand victory. Um, Basin Reserve, pretty comprehensive win again. Um Henry Nichols, um, I said it on the last pod, didn't I give him one game more than uh, one game less? Uh, probably the only prediction I've got right um, in my entire Top Order podcast career. But you must be pretty stoked, uh, you Kiwi boys, um, coming into the end of, uh, end of a pretty jam-packed domestic summer. We've still a little bit of cricket to go. We've mm. still got the, the white ball stuff against uh, Sri Lanka. A couple of games at Eden Park as well, which will be nice for um, Auckland crowds. who have been really starved of international mm. cricket for for a little while, but down to the basin we go. Um, thoughts on that test match? Oh, look, I never doubted the selectors. They were that's uh, they were they were right, eh? Right all along. Who, you, who's... you know that everything you say on this podcast <laughs> is now on the internet in perpetuity. Yeah, right? yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Look, but I, I mean, it was kind of the classic New Zealand test win, right? The thing that we've been used to for the last five or six years. We've been going. Okay, well, this you know this team's coming to New Zealand, not one you know not one of the elite top three nations coming here. They're coming ha- coming to New Zealand. This pitch will look very very green. They'll they'll see it and they'll go, oh, okay, well you know maybe we better bowl first. Mm-hmm. We'll bat you know we'll bat bat for ages and then knock them over twice and win the game. And it was kind of I don't know just business as usual. Although we kind of haven't seen that business for a little while. Yeah, I mean, I completely agree with you. It feels like you know three, four years ago when we when mm. we when we did that, um, you know, regularly. Uh, the only day I actually got to see was that day where Kane Williamson and Henry Nichols batted pretty much all day. And you guys know how much I love watching batsmen just bat. Mm. Uh, so that was very very pleasurable. And uh, yeah, I think we just go straight into that. What about the batting there from from Kane Williamson and Henry Nichols with Kane? It's just incredible to see how much he dominates when he is on mm-hmm. on song. We've been missing that for maybe 18 months or so, but the last two tests, he's just looked absolutely unfailable. And I think that's, I think we might have said it when we were talking about kind of what was missing from the side, you know, a few months ago, and we we're saying, you know, what, like they were kind of winning, not winning those big moments. And even last home summer, we we're thinking kind of, what what is it about this side? Because the guys that have come in, like Blundell and Mitchell, and the recent players that have taken over from Taylor and Watling and all those other players, but it was Kane all along. Like it's Kane all along. He's the one that's driven our batting and driven these big scores. I mean, I pulled out some scores, some stats for him. It's eight thousand Test runs now, ten hundred and fifty plus scores, six two hundreds, and he's actually got one in last in one. In the last five consecutive seasons, he's got a double hundred. Mm. So all of the last years, he's he averages sixty four between twenty seventeen and twenty third, and now with fourteen hundreds in that time and th- just thirty eight matches, the highest batting averages in Test wins, second only to Don Bradman. Mm. Hundred and th- Bradman averages one hundred and thirty, which is kind of fairly Sweet. useful. <laughs> yep. but but Kane <laughs> averages eighty one point five and forty Test wins for New Zealand. That I mean that. If there's any example of how important a he is, player is to their nation, yeah, I feel like that's that's the one stat that you pull out every time. And I mean, Bully, uh, I look across to you with your magnificent facial hair going on at the moment. Kane's beard, I mean, it's, honestly, but it's as the best, someone it's who the best, doesn't shave very often, yeah, it's best beard in world cricket oh. by far. Um, the other stat that I pulled out the other day, now we're just 54 in Test cricket, which for a New Zealander playing in New Zealand, in as you said earlier, Raj, sometimes fairly bowler-friendly conditions is an exceptional performance. And no New Zealander has really ever got close over a long period of time to averaging 50, let alone 54, I mean, over an extended period. The other one that I picked up the other day, six, I think, double hundreds at home, which I think now is second only to, I think Bradman had seven seven double hundreds out of his 12 at home. Might not, um, that might not be exactly right because he got that may, double hundred in Pakistan. Oh, so maybe he has five at home and that's in the top four or five 
all time. So, yeah, you know, he's, he's continuing to break records for New Zealand and proving to be, you know, the talismanic figure that we know he's been for, for many, many years. I think, Raj, what I really enjoyed about watching those two bat is that those first two sessions, they actually kind of upped the ante, didn't they? They, they kind of got themselves back in and then immediately it was like, okay, we're taking charge now. And it, it's sort of a style that we haven't done. It, you know, Kane, traditionally, I guess, in the last 12 months, we've we've almost been critical of him because he's been, you know, waiting, waiting, waiting to put the foot down. And then in this test, it was like, I'm in now. It's it's game on. Mm. Yeah, look, look, they paced it absolutely beautifully. They, did, they weren't reckless. They made sure that they stamped their authority. Sri Lanka, to their credit, did try things like, you know, got bowling short, bowling around the wicket. They probably just don't have the uh, artillery to, to make that work. And when they tried that, we didn't back away from it. We actually went after them. Mm. They were making uh, they, this commentary has been horrible, on, on, on but we'll, we can leave that <laughs> out. But they were talking about how Hank Kane Williamson hasn't scored uh, what, a six in a very, very oh, yeah, long time, yeah. and he hit two back-to-back and um, with that short theory that they were trying to employ. But, mm. yeah, I, I think the way that they batted was, was perfect. It's almost like they scripted it. What about the run rate? Because I guess, I, look, I don't want to say that this is a bit of basketball phenomenon, but 4.7 and over, um, the scoring rates across the whole summer in New Zealand have mm. been we've been good. We've talked a lot about the pitches, and I think, you know, you look at George DeBell, who loves a, um, a picture of a pitch two days out <laughs> from a game where it looks like a, a bowls green rather than a, than a cricket uh, cricket wicket. But... Um, it, Good place to bat, really, isn't it? The base, and you kind of you've got you've got to actually look probably upwards rather than mm. downwards at the at the conditions. Was there a mistake at the toss? Do you think from from Sri Lanka? I, I mean, th- it's the result would now. suggest that, right? But yeah, kind of. It's easy to say that now. I think I, I don't know. I mean, you any side you turn up, you see the wicket that did. Uh, you're talking about two days out, uh, even the day the day of the yeah. game. I think it looked it looked very green, and you it know. was softer than I think. It turned. It looked. It, it was softer than it looked as well, especially on day one. I think so. I don't have a problem with making that choice. Maybe just execution. I think was probably was lacking a little bit. Yeah, I think if we look back at kind of what they did in that first test, they just didn't give us anything to hit. They made it so difficult for us to score. And as soon as as soon as partnerships built in the second test, New Zealand was just able to capitalise because there were there were. I mean, those balls that Kane was hitting for six, yeah, they were short balls. They were they started to get into this rhythm of giving us, like um, I think it was uh, uh, Lahiru. Lahiru yeah. was certainly way looser, I thought, mm, in this I test. praised him last week, and I think that might have been the reason yeah, we, for him. we talked forward. about the Sri Lankan <laughs> seamers, didn't we, and, and said how well we thought they, they actually bowled. And then, um, yeah, the, the, the bowling figures don't make uh, pretty mm. reading, do they, for that first No, that innings. made me look a goose there, really, to be fair. Um, but well, it's not the first, not the first time, time, might be the last yeah. year, fair enough. <laughs> yeah. What about what about Nichols? What what do we want to say about him? Because I I I I find this a really tricky conversation because it was I said you, it was your Will Young stock. Yeah, you, you know, there's an insider trading situation going on here, isn't well, there? Well, no, there's not because uh, it just shows the amazing depth that we have in New Zealand cricket, doesn't it? That we've got a, a quality player like him sitting on the sideline. But I think it's more the fact that. Yeah, Nichols, I said it was a classic New Zealand test. That included Henry Nichols being dropped a couple of times in a, in a home test. Mm. And it, it wasn't exactly vintage, you know, vintage innings to start with. But once he got going, he did. He was very, very positive. I think that was the, the one thing that stood out. Sometimes he's another batter who tries to grind away. Mm. But as soon as he got to about 30 or 40, he was stepping away, cutting it uh, through the offside. He was really trying to, I, I don't know if it, he's not, it's not really hit your way out of it, but he was he was definitely trying to be positive and, you know, maybe he thought, look, if I'm going to go down, if this is going to be, you know, a, a time for me, that then I'm going to do it in, in my way. And look, uh, he did a great job. And that's I think that's what he's been able to do when he's gotten to these he's gotten to these slow slumps. When he actually gets dropped, he does usually cash in and, and get big scores. And it was a, it was a very critical score. But what do we do now? Well, just just on on his innings, I actually think he played a incredibly good, you know, second fiddle role mm. to Kane and, and supported mm-hmm. that partnership. Mm-hmm. There's a veteran at both ends, fellas, so um, he did a great job uh, in that partnership uh, with Kane. And then finishing it off towards the end, you know, charging towards his his double hundred. I was talking about this with a, with a couple of mates yesterday. His his test record is actually a very very good. Oh yeah, New Zealand cricket test record. Yeah, I'm just thirty eight. Yeah. 
Well, it's got eight, what nine hundreds now. Yeah, it's it's yeah, just yeah. it's it's um something you don't really see in the New Zealand history of their their, their batsmen anyway. But uh, do I think that we have put out our best top order? Probably not. Um, in 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 that team, and you know, I didn't get a chance to express my Saudi batting at eight um, feelings last. Should we last unpack week. that now? No, we'll leave, <laughs> we can leave that one alone. But um, I just I'm not sure that he is in our best uh, best top order and. It's hard to say that when a guy's just scored a double hundred, so mm. it might be a bit harsh. Oh, this is parallels with David Warner here because David Warner scored the big double hundred on Boxing Day, but hasn't scored a run before or since um, in many, many bats. So I think there's a little bit of the you know diving judging to go on here. If you take the batter's best score and worst score out of a summer, and then you have a look at what lies in the middle, normally that's a reasonably good indication of what kind of form they're in. And in this case, Henry Nichols, you take his best score and his worst score out, and you're not left with a lot. Um, David Warner the same. So I think there's still a question of form there, but he has gone a long way towards answering, you know, some of his more um, stringent or more or vocal critics, of which I am one of them. Ask me why I think that that top order isn't the best top mm. order. Why don't you think that top order is the question. best, Raj? Well, I'm glad you've asked that. But the reason <laughs> I think that is I actually I've had a I have a bugbear with Devin Conway batting opening the batting. Yeah, I do too. When there is kind of an open. Let's do that with, with these little... You can do that. You can do, right, with those you can do as many of those hand uh, signals as you like. There is probably an open spot there at number four, and I think that Conway would... It's a perfect Conway-sized gap there to, mm. to, to fit him in, and I, I would just rather that he was batting there, and that's why I think that's the big sort of brick that makes our top order stronger as him betting at so, four. So that's Will Young to open, and then... Well, Will Young or even... R- you know, or even a Russian Ravindra, like... Just, Putting someone else there to, to open the batting, I um, I, I think, yeah, that, that's why I have reservations about the strength of our mm-hmm. order. I, I think the tricky part about that is that Conway's been so successful at opening. He's but, been doing such a great job. And I think that if you look back at the past 12 months or 18 months when people have been going, what's uh, kind of what's happening with New Zealand, we're, we're dropping down the pecking order a little bit, is that the Conway Latham part of it's been. The, almost the best bit. Yeah. Well, don't even look at it from a New Zealand perspective. Look at it from opening batters around the world. Probably mm-hmm. only in the last uh, 18, 24 months, you've got Robert Sharma, who's probably got a pretty decent record. Um, but opening has been a really, really tough gig. So I think if you've got a guy that's averaging over 40 opening the batting, that's a, that's a, particularly when we've seen that sort of set the tone in so many test matches in, in mm. recent times, that kind of positive, positive start. You just wonder whether you give a bit of momentum away by, by not having someone who, he scores his runs pretty quickly at the top of the order as well, but, yeah, but, yeah. We, but relatively classically, right? Um, so yeah, look, nice, nice dilemmas to have mm. that you're talking about a guy who's just got a double hundred who prior to probably the last 12 months had a pretty decent, overall test record um and now you're saying you know a, a guy is you know last dig um i always thought you were as good as your last dig so um <laughs> m- man he, he's gonna feel pretty uh, uh yeah pretty pretty bummed if, you if he misses out the next time you play test cricket from him. He, he scored 200 not out. Mm. and he played really well we will get in i want to get into a little bit of bigger picture stuff with new zealand because we're sort of at the end of i mean we're going like you said we're going into our white ball games against sri lanka but actually like players are going off to the ipl these are going to be two squads that are certainly depleted from our, our top 11. Mm. So I do want to dive into kind of where we are, New Zealand cricket sort of spot, but I guess just touching on bits and pieces from that game. The other two sort of players that we'd kind of had question marks over was the the Blair Tickner spot. So any thoughts on on his performance? I actually um, it, I found it very interesting how he how he fit into that bowling attack in a a different role without Wagner there. He sort of took that role, and I actually thought he he kind of did a reasonable job. And, and, you know, he's not Neil Wagner. He wasn't wasn't Neil Wagner. He wasn't able to do the exact same thing. But in that role, he looked like a much better fit in our bowling attack than he had in that whole summer so far. Yeah, I think probably bar one spelly bowled at Mount Monganui, I thought looked pretty good. when everyone seemed to be going short and he actually came in and bowled a hard length length with Kugel line for a period of time and looked pretty good. But yeah, to come on and, you know, you, I'm pretty sure you were bowling to, were you bowling to seven, two leg side field at one point? That we were certainly, I don't know what the rules are around that, but yeah, certainly, um, it had a feel of, uh, the leg side theory. It had a bit of body line in it, didn't it? Yeah. Um, and did it, you know, did a really good job. And that was going to be one, one of my questions for you is really that we talked a little bit about those batting depth charts for you. Um, have you learned something from this game with Bracewell and, and probably Tickner being asked to do a little bit more about what maybe the, the next 18 months looks like for your test side? 
Well, I think it's so tricky. Yeah, I mean, this will, yeah, this kind of segues us into that conversation because Bracewell is another one. Yeah, that, that that has been question marks over, and and mainly I think the question marks are what are his role? Like, what you know, if if he's going to play at seven, he's got to get some runs, or he's got to be you know a frontline spinner, and he's not kind of either of those two things at the moment. He's you know obviously didn't get a chance to get runs in this test. I think we've learnt that those guys can be adequate. It's, it's, I, I don't mean that. And I actually don't mean that in a mean way. I, I mean that, that like those guys are okay. They, I just don't think either of them are going to be world beaters at test level. Mm. I, I think Tech, Techna certainly took strides. I think that's really encouraging. But yeah, I mean, you want to carry on? Well, I actually think that that's actually a really good way to sum that up. They have been adequate at home, but they're still behind the likes of Jameson, uh, even. You know, you think about guys like we don't have in our team, like Bolt. Yeah. Uh, you know, when you talk about the fast bowlers, Milne, uh, Ferguson, and Sears, you know, these people who are probably in, ahead of him. And, you know, when, um, when Blair Tickner got that role or got that call up for the uh, English series, it wasn't England, wasn't it? Mm. Yeah. I was really surprised to see that he got that ahead of someone like Jacob Duffy, mm. who is also in the wings there waiting mm-hmm. to come in. And he probably would be, he probably carry more of a new ball role uh, than, than um, Blair Tickner would. But in New Zealand, adequate, great. What happens when we go out to the subcontinent? What happens when you go to Australia, South Africa? Mm. Uh, you know, I, I'm just not sure how they will go around the world. I think he's been a pretty good third seamer for New Zealand, third or fourth seamer in that attack, right? I think if he's asked to lead the attack in two years, say you don't have Saudi and, and you've got Henry and Tickner, that's probably not in his wheelhouse. But I think as a third seamer for New Zealand, being able to go in and do some hard work and bowl good areas and good lengths, even if he's not doing a lot with the ball, he's he's very he's, he's keeping the batter honest with the lengths that he can bowl. And we saw that in Mount Monganui. Yeah. I'm not sure that he is um, waiting in the wings like Henry was to take Bolt's spot and become a leader of, of the attack just yet. I mean, he may evolve as an international cricketer and he may develop skills learning from South and he may develop, you know, a little bit of swing or, or a little bit more nip off the scene. But he's certainly a, a, a reasonable... Well, much better than I thought he was going to be third seamer or fourth seamer for New Zealand in that attack that you've got. And, and you know, having Jamison might even help you again, having him fill a, a fourth seamer role. Well, I mean, I said it tongue in cheek at the start about, you know, never doubted the selectors. But I, I do think that this sort of the Jamison piece of it is actually a, a huge part of kind of how this development has evolved. And, uh, you know, if you look at that squad, I, I think that they... Obviously, they didn't want to lose Bolt. I'm sure they they went. You know, we we would love to have Trent Bolt, and they obviously opted then to not pick him. Mm-hmm. That we've been through all of that. But you have, you have Jameson, Henry, Southey. That none of these questions are happening. Like nobody's worried about our bowling attack because those three are, I think, quite you know world class bowlers that yes. can that can be our main three. Then you either have Wagner or you have. Tickner or you have someone in the hard working role mm-hmm. and then you've you've or you, know, you have out and out pace. Yeah, or you or have you, a guy who can bowl one forty five. You build your attack that way. And I, I don't think there would have been any concerns because people assume that Jameson's got, you know, five or six years to go. Henry's got a couple of years, good years left in him, so is Saudi, what people hope. So I I don't think that there's any concerns. Mm. But, you know, I think what this has shown this summer is that the fast bowling is the area that New Zealand doesn't have that depth. And, and you know, younger players that, you know, mentioned Sears before, Matthew Fisher went on the New Zealand A Tour. Those two have been just hit by injuries. We've seen Lockie, Milne, you know, all these guys that have this out-and-out pace in New Zealand, none of them can seem to stay fit. And there doesn't really seem to be, you know, all the, all the guys that are leading the Plunkett Shield wicket charts, they're the Doug Bracewells, the Jacob Duffies, the, the guys that have been – in the in the mix for a long time, and you know, I actually thought Bracewell did a reasonable job. I like you. I think Duffy would do a decent job at first cl- at Test level, but he's probably your you know your Tim Southey replacement. He's not your you, you know he's not your Kyle Jameson replacement, if you mm. know what I mean. Like they, they're slightly different roles. So yeah, I, I think that what it has exposed is the fact that. That depth isn't there, you know. If you're looking at all the different areas of New Zealand cricket, I think that's the one that that the alarm bells might be ringing a little bit. Yeah. But before we move on, a word on Sri Lanka. Let's not forget they were a chance to get, um, pretty long chance to get into the World Test Championship final. They needed to win the series, I think, two uh, 0 didn't they? And yeah. um, um, probably have some other stuff go their way. But um, 
I thought they were pretty impressive given, um, uh, obviously, the, that first innings notwithstanding, but, you know, they showed some application with that second innings. Pretty much all of their batters got in. Um, we talked a little bit about their same as in that first mm. uh, that first match. You like, the, you like the look of the left arm spinner as well, Joe Serrer, I think. Oh, he's okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, yep. And so, I like Don and Jai De Silva as well. So, in the bottom of the middle order. Do we think that they come into the, the mix? It's kind of really, I guess, clogged up that, you know, fourth, fifth, sixth kind of spot, hasn't it, in, in world cricket at mm. the moment? Um, obviously, India and Australia will be facing off at the Oval in the, the World Test Championship final. South Africa must be third. Uh, yes, South Africa's yeah. third. Yeah, England, Sri Lanka, New Zealand, very close, kind of four, five, six. I can't remember the actual. I think it might have been England, Sri Lanka, New Zealand, or yeah. Or, anyway, doesn't really matter. Those three very close mm. in the in the four, five, six, and I think that that probably is actually quite a fair reflection on where all of those teams are. I mean, I would say New Zealand down at sixth is probably a tiny bit low. Yep. In my opinion, but actually, given the you know, given the fact that it sort of doesn't necessarily no rush. matter too much. The, the massive problem with the World Test Championship is that probably the best team in the world is not in the final. England, the best Test team in the world currently for the last twelve months is not in in, in mm. the final, and and, and that, that's a problem to me. And they've pl- just the number of tests; it's just it not being equal. You know, doing it with the percentage-based, you know, points to get, you know, sort out the standings, it, it, it doesn't make sense. To it, me. It's very difficult to get a good system, yeah. right? Because New Zealand are negatively impacted. If you're only playing a two-test series yeah. and you lose a test, that is a large percentage or a larger percentage of the test that you play as compared to playing seven tests in a home summer. So, you know, there, there are there are some real challenges there. And I agree, England are the form team in world cricket at the moment and they're not going to be there. In, in, in this cycle, I think that England must have one more test than some nations have played. Yeah. Oh, like, easily. Yep. Yeah, look, uh, it's, it's difficult. I actually want to argue, but I, <laughs> I, I, I probably can't. We need an eliminator or well, a, or I, a well, baconator I do, I do or think something. That, I do think that uh, this is going to sound a bit silly because I want to defend New Zealand here as well, but I the, the proof will be in the pudding for England when they do f- play against Australia mm-hmm. and when, you know, maybe when they go have a longer series against India. Obviously, they played that one test against India uh, early, yeah, you know, shoehorned into this. Exactly, summer. India came straight from pretty much you know franchise leagues, yeah, etc. Yeah. yeah. Whereas they, they, I feel like they took New Zealand by surprise in that first three match series that you know we, we played against them. They beat a very poor Pakistan team. I'm disappointed that New Zealand didn't win yeah. ag- against them. I, I, I actually think that yeah, that they, they are a weak side. Uh, I, yeah, I'm not trying to downplay England. I do think they've played some awesome cricket, but I think yeah. India and Australia, yeah, it's hard, It's really hard to judge those three. And, and, I mean, I think that's why, for me as a neutral, the Ashes often doesn't have that much excitement. But this time I am kind of like, oh, you have to be. this is going to be good. Because, oh, you have to be. Because it, it, it might just be shit, though. Like, <laughs> it might be the worst. We might get a, either a massive rainstorm or just the most well, yeah. turgid cricket. In oh, the that world. would be that would be with the biggest the biggest audience letdown from it, since it, from dusk till dawn. I think it, it would. Look, we talked a little bit India Australia before we segue to that. Um, let's just um, engage our listeners and watchers now with the sports podcast awards. So um, our little old podcast has been nominated for. Um, a cricket award. Um, so if you do have a couple of minutes, um, go and find your way to sportspodcastgroup.com. You can then navigate to awards, find your way to the cricket um, page, have a little dabble with the best archery podcast if you want to as well. Um, I, I like a quiver full of arrows myself, <laughs> um, but do go and find your way uh, to the, the cricket it's awards. Quite a good name. Yeah, I, it, it's a good might, name for a book. I don't even know whether it is a real archery podcast or whether there's awards, but that there, should there be. is a book that, called that. Yeah, mm. th- th- there is. So um, <laughs> he doesn't know that either. I, I don't. I do know that quiver full. It's a Jeffrey Archer book. Is, I'm yeah. pretty sure it is oh. a book of short stories. I wow. believe. Um, so yeah, in your face. Anyway, <laughs> uh, <laughs> but look, we we digress a little bit. But if you do have a minute, please go and give us a vote at the sports podcast. You can use awards. in your face as a segue. I can in your face. So anyway, let's if, talk before before we uh, before we do go to India. Can you segue back to it then? Uh, well, no, bef- I, I, we don't need to segue back to it because basically we haven't we haven't kind of all been in the same room for a little while, and we haven't really had Raj's thoughts on on New Zealand. So I'm I'm quite keen to get your thoughts on just where New Zealand. How are you feeling about New Zealand cricket at the moment? Because I think, you know, the start of the summer, there's been a lot of 
a lot of negativity and a lot of we've got on this aging side, you know, we can't win the big moments. We've got no depth. Like has this summer, you know, these three wins, has it given you any more, you know, positivity or, or are we still sort of a middling side that might do okay at some stage? The, the win against England, uh, was an incredible performance to turn that around mm. uh, and, and win that game from where they were. Uh, it's a, it's a, a great performance. And the problem with that is that I think that's a bit of an outlier mm. um, with this Sri Lankan series towards the end of the summer, it's going to paper over some cracks. And, you know, I've, I've spoken about it with, a, with, with you guys and, and other people. I just don't think that we currently have our, what is our best 11? Do we know what that is? Yeah. We have Saudi batting at eight in that first test in, against Sri Lanka really annoyed me. I know it shouldn't have annoyed me so much. It really brought me down for a couple of days, um, him batting at eight. But I, I just, I don't know what our current best 11 is. We have injuries, you know, like every team that goes through. But yeah, I, I cannot accurately place us in mm. that world championship list. We're not where we are, I don't think. But how can we argue that we're better than South Africa when we lost to them at home? Yeah. You know, how, how can we argue that we're up there with the, with the big three when we're really probably not at this stage? Mm. That's my issue with it. I, I, I'd be interested to know your thoughts, Stu, around where we think we're going with, are you happy with how we've gone with Saudi at the helm? Has that changed anything for you? Um, you know, Steady's performance as, as coach and selector, how, how do you think that's gone? I think that the hard bit for out of all of this is we're not playing test cricket again until I think it's December, November or December. So we've like, I feel like we've debated all this stuff and in my head, I've thought about it. I've given a lot of thought to like, yeah, where's this test side going? But I think by then we'll have a different coach and we'll have, you know, potentially some different players, you know, Steady's contract runs out after the cricket world, uh, the ODI world cup. I'd be, I'd be stunned if he reapplies. I'd be stunned if, you know, they appointed him again. I think he's been at the helm for a long time. You know, I'm obviously very biased, but I think he's done a, you know, he's done a really good job. New Zealand's been really good under his, um, stewardship with him and Larson. You know, whether they, whether some, whether the depth now is, you know, how much you put the blame on those guys and, and how much it's on the system or whatever, COVID, whatever you want to put it under. But in terms of kind of, yeah, where we're at, I think I'm pl- I'm sort of these three wins have given me a lot of positivity. But I actually think the the best part about it's actually been some of the domestic stuff and seeing some of the younger guys come through. I think there's been some really positive signs with people like Muhammad Abbas, who I mentioned last week, Reese mm. Mario. There's some younger batters I think coming through. Phillips, obviously, Glenn Phillips. You know, everyone's kind of really excited about him, and so I, I think there's enough depth in New Zealand cricket. We've seen the, the A side get named today and Addy Ashok's in that side and you know we've still got Ajaz who you know I don't think the door should be shut on someone like him he's you know he's got 10 How wickets can you in shut innings. a door on a guy who got exactly. 10 wickets in yeah. an innings? So I, I think the same you can shut a door on a guy that's got 200 in his yeah, last innings point. as well. Mm-hmm. But yeah I think there are there are lots of different parts of New Zealand cricket and if you're building your test side I think there are you know certainly there's depth in a lot of those positions it's the same as that I, I, I am worried about and yeah what what this team looks like in, in, you know, that by the time we go to Bangladesh, it'll look completely different. But then, you know, next summer is when we have the challenge. We've got two tests against South Africa, two tests against Australia at home. That'll be when we find out where the site is because it's a, a year gone. And, and just to kind of end it on a positive note, you, you know, you've always said over, you know, the last five years, the cycle we've been through, New Zealand's always done what they need to win the game. Mm. And that has been really good to see over the last three tests is that we've done what we have to to turn that test around and to eke out that win against Sri Lanka in that, that first test, which got very mm-hmm. exciting down the pub, I tell you. Absolutely. There was mm. a lot of celebrations. Yeah, there, so but, um, people lost things yes. in the excitement yeah, and I lost my forgot wallet. where they were and <laughs> all sorts of things. It was I fantastic. It. I found it. Though. Fantastic. Yeah. It. Um, but, uh, yeah, I just think that's good. From a positive point of view, we are doing what we need to to win, yeah. which is back mm. to what we have been doing over the last five years. That was yeah. a very long segue. Yeah, sorry, but <laughs> you, you, I, you, you said last week you were amazed at the fact that I can always throw it back to New Zealand. So, and domestic and New Zealand domestic cricket. cricket. I've got a few domestic names in yep. there for you. So, you know, we can move now to, to the you know, this boring, you know, limited over series in, in a different country if, I've if got, you like. I've got that on my stu, stu lip show bingo, domestic <laughs> New Zealand cricket. I've got that center square, so I'm, I'm on track here. Yes. Michael, let's have a little chat, you and me, for a minute, <laughs> shall we? Um, 
Yeah, look, I guess the test matches are, are now finished. Mm-hmm. We're rapidly into those meaningless ODIs, meaningless mm-hmm. ODIs in in the lead up to the T uh, to the fifty over World Cup. Yeah, yeah, okay, in, fair in enough. Did, did, I thought you were going to say in the lead up to the exciting IPL. Well, th- there is that. Uh, the, the thing I find really fascinating is we're not that far away from that World Cup. They still haven't announced the date yet, have they? Like, I it, think it's September. No, no, they've announced the when it is, but yeah, they've got no no grounds, no, no fixtures, no detail. But yeah, I, I guess the the first two ODIs, a couple of bowling performances of note. Mm-hmm. Um, I think Ravi Jadeja was man of the match in the first game, but Shami mm-hmm. knocked the top off the Australian order to probably set that up. And then mm. uh, Mitchell Stark. I don't know how much of that game you saw, but um, one minute I think Mitchell Johnson was talking about how bad his radar was, the ball wasn't <laughs> swinging, he didn't know where his wrist was, and then all of a sudden it's curved. He, he found it. He found, yeah, where he found it was. very <laughs> very quickly. <laughs> Um, so yeah, um, again, we, we touched on the commentary, didn't we? I think, and, uh, mm-hmm. um, on the New Zealand stuff, um, I've got to say <laughs> it gets worse the later you watch cricket. I think the more, <laughs> I think you, the more you say on TV, the more often you're wrong. I think uh, the problem with That's making probably, bold predictions on mm. television is that, you know, people like us watch it and then, and then so we shouldn't it. be re- recording yeah. this podcast. No, we shouldn't. We? No, 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 we should go say, back to just doing this. this, doing this in the pub with the microphone off. Um, <laughs> Look, I think Australia have found the answer to life after David Warner at the top of the order, at least in their white ball cricket sides. Travis Head, I really, really like at the top of the order, and I've been, you know, no secret that I've done that for some time. But Mitchell Marsh at the top of the order, even if you're going back to the T uh, Twenty World Cup yeah. where he batted at three, and and you know occasionally has opened for Australia, has been a real success. A great left hand right hand combination. I think they bat very very well together. And of course, in that second ODI when they chased 117 or 120 odd none down. They really kind of dominated proceedings. I yeah. I really like Mitchell Marsh at the top of the order. The Australian selectors, Ronald McDonald and Co, have made no secret that they want to have as many all rounders as possible in their side. You know, yeah. there's a possibility that Cameron Green plays in that ODI side at some point and bats at number eight to give them as many bowl, a batting and bowling options as possible. So you know, having Marsh, Stoinis, Maxwell, and even Abbott to an and, extent, and Abbott can bat. Cameron Green. Sorry, Raj. Is Ashton Agar there? I'm not sure. Uh, I don't think I've seen Ashton Agar no, in this no. series. Um, but I, even, I mean, even Cummins is mm. Even Cummins can bet, so. you know. Um, so, yeah, look, Australia have got lots of options, I think, in the same way that two years ago leading into the T20 World Cup, we're still kind of figuring out what our best combinations are, how we reintegrate David Warner, given the form that he's in and how well Head and Marsh have done in his absence. You know, I don't know how you reintegrate Warner. Um, into the team, but there's certainly lots to like uh, from a depth perspective, and we haven't even touched on the fast bowling yet, other than other than Stark. Yeah. Can I just quickly ask: Is, is Mitchell Marsh? Like I guess he's good now. Just is that just a thing that's going forward? Because I, I mm-hmm. in my head, I have just still, you know, I still have him as not good. Do I have to you, change that? Or was, you do need to change that. He is good at cricket. Good, it, okay. It was that previous World Cup, wasn't <laughs> it? Really, where he batted yeah. three in the in, yes. U, in UAE, where yeah, he yeah. really burst onto the scene well, in the terms 12- of the. Those kind of pitches. Yeah. The yeah. 12 months before that, though, when Australia had all of their players out, Smith out, Cummins yeah, out, yeah. and all the rest of it, mm-hmm. and they were kind of experimenting with different lineups, he batted at three most of that 12-month period and did really well, earned his spot, and then did really, really well at the yeah. World Cup. So, And he's just gone on from strength to strength from there. I mean, he's not bowling at the moment, I don't think, or bowling very, very little, but does have that that string to his bow as well. There's just so many variables, isn't there? I think mm-hmm. a, a lot of teams seem to be doing this now with trying to get as many all-rounders. And if you if you look at even England through this um, uh, one day and T20 series against Bangladesh, they've kind of not called up players that you thought, mm. well, hold on, so and so is injured. They've gone, nah, we'll just bump Sam Curran up. We'll bump Moen Ali up. We'll bump yeah. the all-rounders up the order because I think obviously they they want that depth in that 50 over World Cup, and it's yep. you know, it seems to be a little bit of a a way of trying to. Um, essentially say that probably players that are used longer. to their roles and, and can yeah can attack for longer is going to be the option for mm-hmm. that that 50 over tournament we've got the IPL in the middle which could change things from an injury perspective so mm. and yeah. a form perspective you know yeah. players have found and lost form in the IPL um, over the years as well so you know there's lots to like and watch about that IPL tournament in the lead up to the World Cup and you know players could emerge um, you know, we're going to see Tim David in the World Cup. We're going to see a bunch of Australians uh, performing there as well as, you know, English and, and a couple of New Zealanders. And the final one day are tomorrow, 22nd of March, played mm-hmm. in Chennai. So any predictions, Bordy, or do you think it's I've just... I've got no a, idea. No idea. <laughs> no, no idea. Absolutely none. But Like, Australia could get beaten by 10 wickets. It wouldn't surprise me in the least. It's such a lottery at the moment between this... Australia and India side, and it tends to be that one side will get on top of the other and dominate. We saw that in the Test Series, right? One side gets on top and dominates and and gets a resounding win, and then the next game, 
the other team finds itself on the front foot and they can assert their dominance um, over the other. So what about, I have no um, idea. Just talking about the Indians, what about Sky? Everything seems to have changed. It's yeah. fallen. Three months, four months ago, he was the greatest batsman on the planet, and now they want to drop him. So I, I don't know what's going on there. I mean, he's got a couple of couple of good cherries early on in his innings, and you know, I think Greg Chappell went through a, a, a phase where he scored like zero zero one zero zero one. He kind of a binary phase, and someone asked him if he was out of form, and he said, "I've got no idea. I haven't been in long enough to figure it out." <laughs> so I think there is an element of that with Sky. You know, he hasn't been long enough in to get out of form because he's just been getting some pretty good deliveries early doors and he got a good one the other yeah, day as well two, two two golden ducks in a row yeah yeah so you know there's yeah. there's not a lot you can do about that sometimes that, you get that, a good cherry doors exactly and smash it straight to points yeah. it's it's funny isn't it though with him because it seems like yeah. the 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 t20 seems to be so much better than the 50 over for him like I, and i don't i've never really understood how like why that happens or how it happens, but it it keeps coming coming true because mm -hmm. yeah, and and if you look, I mean, if you look at his ODI numbers, they're just nothing compared to to his T Twenty stats. Well, be, before Lippy finds a way to bring this back to uh, to New Zealand wow. domestic cricket, um, we've seen a retirement today. Uh, Tim Payne has uh, announced his retirement from mm. all, all formats. All formats. Want to give uh, you look a little bit more Australian content to the podcast before we get back to to New Zealand stuff. Any. No Any prepared thoughts remarks. on that? No, no prepared remarks on Any Tim Payne. Any unprepared remarks? Um, I mean, he's been a tremendous servant for Australian cricket when they really needed a leader to step up in the in the aftermath of the South Africa scandal. Um, I look, he he probably won't go down as the ta most talented um, Australian captain ever from a batting point of view or a wicket keeping point of view, but you know he was able to take a culture forward and take a team forward that was in tatters after that after that um, Cape Town incident. So from that perspective, he was, Raj, forgive me if I get the Batman quote wrong, but he was the hero that Australia needed but didn't deserve or something like that. I've got that horribly wrong, I'm sure. Probably along those lines. Um, but, yeah, I mean, he he will go down as as one of Australia's better glovemen, I think, um, from a purist, purist wicket-keeping perspective. is an excellent, excellent wicket-keeper and probably deserved to play in that Australian side for, for a lot longer you know, that devastating finger injury kept him out for several yeah. years as well. So, um, yeah, and he, he was a great servant to Australian cricket when we really needed him, and I think that's what he'll be remembered for. Are you going to look back on his career and think how much that finger injury impacted him? Because he scored 100, didn't he? And then he hurt his finger. 90, or I think 90 he got. Yeah, 90 yeah, he didn't quite get 100. And then, yeah. and then he didn't come back for and For years. a long time, years and years and years. It took him ages to get back. His debut was at Lords in that test against Pakistan, wasn't it, where they played it on neutral... It, it was a Lords. Been, it was yeah. a long time ago, yeah. and, and he burst onto the scene quite early, and then was out for ages and ages and ages. And then you know, other wicket keepers came and and had a bit of a crack, Neville and Haddon and so forth. So, did you hear how he informed Cricket Australia that he was? Did you send him a text uh, message? I don't know. I'm just uh, I don't know. <laughs> I think it was a WhatsApp. Uh, a WhatsApp, WhatsApp I think. Yeah. Yeah. Brilliant. Moving on. Um, yeah, before we before we get ourselves in trouble. <laughs> Lippy, allegedly, we, we we want to talk about uh, Sophie Devine. So. Uh, I, this women's IPL or Whipple or Women's Premier League, I don't know what the, the official moniker is, has been fantastic viewing. We've seen some really high-scoring games. This one, uh, Gujarat against the RCB, no exception to that. I think notable also to, I think, the fastest delivery um, mm. speed gun in women's cricket, Ooh, Elise scary. Perry. How, how fast? Um, 135 or something? Yeah, yeah holy was, shit. Yeah, so a, a couple of, I guess, milestones in that. But I think we've got to talk about that 99 and uh, also a, picked up a wicket as well, I think, in that, in that game in a um, a victory that where they chased down 189 in 15 overs, holy which shoot. is pretty uh, pretty good. Honestly, if, you, if listeners have not seen the highlights, of, like you will not see a better T20 innings than, than that Sophie Devine inning. I mean, yeah, 99 off 36 balls kind of says all you need to say. But, I mean, yeah, she hit... She hit some enormous, enormous sixes. Ninety-four meters with I think one of the one of the sixes. I mean, it, it's sort of. I feel like it's sort of belittling when they go on about it in the commentary. But Harsha Bogle was just. They were just kind of going. Oh, I don't need to bring the boundaries into for Sophie Devine, but it's which is sort of a bit ridiculous. But she honestly was just. She was hitting them up into the rafters. It was an amazing, amazing innings. And like you say, they were chasing a big score and. It was sort of over, you know. It was over after after ten overs. She she put the game beyond doubt, and I mean, yeah, I, I don't want to dive too deeply into the the actual run of the tournament because it's you know IPL kind of that that tournament set up. It's it, it, in a day's time when people are listening to this, it'll be the, completely different. The, it'll be a little bit out of date, but it, you know, RCB has struggled a, a little bit in this tournament really early on. They struggled a lot. 
Amelia Kerr played well, though, I think, at the beginning. She's, yeah, yep, yep. So Mumbai's going well for, yeah, yeah that Mumbai side, yeah. Yeah, they did really well at the auction, didn't they? I mean, yeah, they've obviously got um, Nat Siva Brunt. Um, he's going pretty well. Izzy Wong, from an English perspective as well, coming, yep. she's actually batting up the order and bowling rapid. Um, hit a six uh, off her only ball in that first game. Um, so they did really, really well at the the auction. So, yeah, Delhi and Mumbai at the top of the table, I think. Yeah, and that Delhi side, oh, we talked about them a couple of weeks ago. Yeah, yeah that, you know, that top that top order that they possess is, you know, reasonable. It's, it's, it's unreal. So, yeah, I mean, I, I would, you know, I, I still think they're the, they're the side that I would be looking at. You know, when, when I look at T20 sides, it's always that top three. If you have a powerful top three, basically you can just win any game. And, and I think that's what Sophie Devine showed. I mean, I think people were pretty stoked with RCB's. Uh, draft when they, you know, I, I remember logging on, you know, to the social media after, after that draft and everyone was kind of going, Oh, they got pe- the least, pe- they picked up Elise Perry and Sophie Devine and, you know, on and on and on and, and, you know, hand them the trophy now. They've won. And then they, you know, kind of how it goes, isn't it? Kind of how it goes with RCP, unfortunately, as well. I did see, you know, Virat was, was in there the other day, kind of giving them an, an inspirational talk. So maybe that, that helped turn things around. But, yeah, look, um, I mean, like you say, it's it's been a really fun tournament. It's it's sort of, the, in in some ways, it's the same as the IPL. It's on, you know, so late at night for us, and with all the other cricket going on in our summer, it's it's hard to catch every single ball. But mm. it, it's it's been fun, and look, I, yeah, like like we talked about a few weeks ago, I think it's going to be great for women's cricket and awesome for India. It's you know their their depth is just going to go through the roof. Well, after we've, this. we've seen it with their men's side over Absolutely. the last four or five years, right? So it's going to do the same thing. Before we wrap up, Lippy, any Rickerton news or anything you want to run through on the on the on the run sheet before we we, hey, we wrap up? I can't believe you opened that door for him. <laughs> yeah, that's that's a that's dangerous dangerous, <laughs> dangerous Rickerton, game. What about Bracewell? Bracewell's RC, RCB gig as well. Yeah, I I, don't, I was quite surprised with that to be honest. I, I, I offline had a chat with you, Raj, about it, and you didn't seem that surprised. But I, I he's been pretty inconsistent for New Zealand. I know, you know, I just think there are. I think there are better T20 players out there. I'm surprised that he kind of got this gig. I, I think it's fantastic for him. It's a it's, little bit of a form pick though, right? Well, whether whether yeah, but, or not his actual form is there or not, he's playing three formats. It, that fantastic, what was it, 140, 140 against yeah. India in India. That's yeah. all he, forget about all his other performances, just that one yeah. has gotten him the gig. And yeah, probably. Well, and it's, absolutely. You know, Mike Hesson's at that, you know, is it involved there as well. So, I'm, you know, I'm sure I, there's a bit of that. And I'm sure it's about how he might go in the squad as well. And, and I think obviously they have that kind of pretty decent old boys network, don't they, from a New Zealand cricket perspective in and around that IPL. Um, in a good way, in, in a positive in, way. No, I mean, in an absolutely yeah. positive way. Uh, and I think that, you know, they obviously talk to each other there. How would he go in this environment? You know, is he going to kind of add to it and enjoy it and, and get the experience from it? And um, I think if you look at it now, that's the way teams are going to go to get their players that level of experience. When for New Zealand, they don't play enough international cricket, mm. particularly, you know, test match. He's probably going to learn more from that um, than he is from, you know, playing um, as harsh as it sounds, first-class cricket or, or, or domestic one-day cricket in New Zealand, isn't it? Well, I, I think that's the huge positive out of all of this, yeah. that, that I, I think he will be an important part of our ODI World Cup squad. You know, what what kind of role he ends up playing in, in that team, who, you know, I'm not quite sure of just yet, but, you know, the fact that he's going to be over there for a month, six weeks or whatever it is, learning those conditions in those, you know, in the, even just in those stadiums, in the in, in the. Mm. You know, in the noise and in, in all of that, soaking all that up, learning the the pace and the the um you know the areas that you need to bowl on those pitches. Oh, yeah, developing your spin bowling is probably nowhere better to go. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I, I think it's, I mean it's great for New Zealand cricket. I, I'm just yeah, just surprised I guess that uh, that he got picked up, but fantastic, awesome. Anything on, else? Any other business? On your uh, the other thing I did find interesting Big was. <laughs> Was uh, the, in in T Twenty League news is this Major League cricket? I did think that was quite a oh, that's newsworthy, yeah, and, that and, and a newsworthy that. little point. And um, I mean, New Zealand listeners will be kind of fascinated to see Corey Anderson. Really, is mm. is the big thing for for us that so I, is he living over there or something? Yeah, yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. His, his wife's wife's American, so he's been over there for quite a while, and. Uh, He's sort of been in the the setup of these sides for for you know the the franchise stuff in America for a little while. I actually had a um, talking about Rick and I yeah she uh, was able there to there it is when actually able Bingo. to, able to what was that you're breaking up. <laughs> 
uh, able to talk to Cole McConkie the other day about when they were here playing, Canterbury was here playing Auckland and talked to him about he's been over to the US sort of playing uh, in some of the franchise stuff over there and, and yeah, talked it up, said it was very, very impressive and uh, like, I mean, they're hosting what, 2024 at uh, T20 jo- World Cup. Joint or, World Cup with the West Indies. Yeah. yeah, although I did see some, I don't know, apparently fake news that they'd, they'd been stripped of the rights, but that, say, that sounds like it was fake news anyway. It's another social media uh, blow up, but yeah, it's going to be pretty fun, I think, this to to watch this. And there's a lot of like the whole bunch of Aussies that mm-hmm. Cricket Victoria's yeah. signed up with one of the franchises. So there's Finch, Mitch Marsh, Stoyness, there's De Kock, there's Norkia, Smith, Has- Hasaranga, mm. Liam Plunkett. Liam Plunkett's oh, he's there. He's living as well. in America I, at the moment, is he not? American as well? wife, yeah, as well, yeah, I think. Yeah. Yeah. But the ECB has said no to uh, ECB contracted players. I've, I have seen that today. Right. But but anyway, look, I mean. Like I, in general, not a huge fan of every single country in the world having a T20 what are league. The but like? have you seen or you haven't seen anything about that? Uh, not uh, a one huge of the grounds part. in Florida is actually well, it's an international standard ground, isn't it? And, mm. and, and I, I think that there's plans to build more and more. And I, I'll probably get this stat wrong, but I think in terms of participation, the USA is the second largest nation a, a, um, after India in terms of participation. There is in lots of participation in yeah. in America, and they've and they've spread out the franchises, right? So I've got it here: um, six teams: Dallas, San Francisco, New York City, Seattle, uh, and that's such in Adela's involvement, um, heavy investment from him. So there's there's some big backing in terms of this yeah. league. There's some mm-hmm. some really big American businessmen getting behind it. Los Angeles and Washington D.C. So there's big markets in there yeah, as yeah. well, right? So there's big money markets in in uh, New York, Los Angeles, um, San Francisco, and also, you know, kind of Dallas and Seattle. And then there's a lot of air miles there. Yeah, lots of of travel. Um, And so, yeah. July 13 kicks off, and the, the season draft was March Should have been 19. July the 4th. They've missed a trick there. Well, they, they? they have. Um, but, yeah, that, that stadium in Dallas has 7,000 seats, I think, um, according to their own their own website. I think when they were trying to get it up and running a while back previously, mm. they talked about playing them in, like, baseball grounds and stuff like that, but I'm not yeah. sure if... No, I think they, that, they actually have built some yep, some, right, some, some proper grounds. proper cricket grounds. So mm-hmm. I think the investment's there. And look I, I, look, I guess it's given it a nudge, particularly with a lot of the expat cricket communities that they've got um, in some of those, yeah, some of those places for, you know, club cricket and mm. whatnot. Um, so, yeah, look, I, I think it's fantastic. Um, who would bet? We, we were talking about this in terms of a FIFA World Cup perspective when the USA will win one of them. Mm. Um, maybe in 10 years' time, we might be talking about it from a cricketing perspective. Um, Let's see. It's a sleeping giant. Right, there's so much potential in the United States in all sorts of sports. So let's see what happens there. I mean, we've seen football come a long way yeah. um, since the development soccer. of major, yeah, of major league football <laughs> slash soccer, soccer football. Yeah. Well, boys, um, probably enough for now. Enough for now. Yeah. Let's He's trying to finish, and you keep interrupting. We'll talk about oh. we'll talk about Ted Lasso <laughs> later. But look, um, for those of you watching on YouTube, please do stick around for the awkward moment where we have to turn off the recording and, and jump over a few cables, etc. For those of you uh, listening on the podcast feed, uh, we hope you've enjoyed tonight's show. We will, of course, be back uh, next week with more cricketing news. Um, views and we've also got interviews lined up over the course of um, the New Zealand off season. Just a quick plug again: get yourself to sportspodcastgroup.com. Give us a vote um, to win Cricket Podcast of the Year against some former international players, uh, pundits, and um, other cricketing dignitaries. You can vote for us for Muppets um, as well, <laughs> whenever you whenever you like. But for now, it is good night and God bless from us all here in Auckland. It's been great being back in the same room, boys. Welcome back mm. um, to Raj and congratulations on the arrival of baby number three. Um, you. You're looking pretty uh, pretty well um, under the eyes for that. Yeah, it was quite hard work, actually. <laughs> <laughs> um, but look, we will end it on that, uh, on that note. Good night and God bless from us all here in Auckland. We'll see you soon.